Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Making headlines this morning, we are tracking Hurricane Nicholas as it moves further into Texas. And President Joe Biden heads to Colorado today to talk about his economic plan and climate change. Nicholas didn't really affect us here in San Antonio. As a matter of fact, this morning there's a touch of humidity left, but temperatures have dropped down to 70 degrees overnight. Good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday the 14th. Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, yeah, nice cool morning. Not bad out there. Of course, we are tracking uh, Nicholas this morning. Here is a live look from the Galveston areas. Nicholas now makes its way inland uh, this morning. Uh, quite a bit of rain and wind there. They are not having a good morning in the Houston metro area, but particularly along the coast itself. And here at home, not too bad, though. Uh, a little bit of rain yesterday. Yeah, we had some of those bands that, that moved through here right about uh, noon, 1 o'clock. Had some rain, uh, picked up about, uh, I think, 0.13 inches. So just about an eighth of an inch of rain out there at the airport. A lot more off to these. But it did take a little bit further east track. And so it's taken all the rain chances pretty much with it. And so, you know, yesterday we had the forecast were still some leftovers. But no, we're pretty much... Uh, high and dry on the backside of this thing. And it, what it has done though is pulled in, speaking of dry, much, much drier air. First of all, <clears throat> excuse me, nothing is showing up on radar right now. A little clutter there around the radar site, but there is uh, Nicholas and it did barely make hurricane status. 75 mile per hour wind, 74 makes it uh, technically a hurricane and it made landfall officially about four hours ago. And as you can see, typical situation, when I was talking about this, the right hand side of the storm in relation to its direction of travel is the rainiest side. So center of the storm is right there just to the say east of Houston or southeast of Houston and all the rain here. So yeah, Louisiana is going to be getting a bunch of it and they picked up a whole heck of a lot of rain over there by Houston. There are some estimates uh, close to about a foot of rain. Obviously it's not done yet here in town. Mold is moderate. Same thing. Fall Elm ragweed is low and boy, good looking morning out there. We've got temperatures that are pleasant. Humidity has dropped down 68 degrees this morning and wind out of the northeast is going to start to pick up somewhat. It is going to be breezy, but very comfortable today. Upper 80, so we will be slightly below normal. Temperatures going to start to creep back back upward as we go on in through the week and maybe a couple of more rain chances way down the road. We'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Steph, Mark. Thank you very much, Mike. Well, for those being affected by the storm, the concern from Nicholas right now is the rain and the storm surge. President Biden overnight approved an emergency declaration for Louisiana, which is still reeling from Hurricane Ida. ABC's Andrew Dimbert has the latest. This morning, Nicholas making landfall along the Texas coast. State of emergency in effect. It fears the storm could dump up to 20 inches of rain in some areas. Overnight, conditions deteriorating near Galveston. This rain not only looks like it's coming in sideways, I can tell you down here it is coming in sideways. Just uh, torrential rain, more than I felt in a storm in a long time. It, it is a, an intense, intense amount of rain. Do not drive through flooded roadways, particularly at night. Every time there's heavy rain, we see people drown, we see vehicles flooded, don't take that chance. Nicholas taking aim at areas hit hard by Hurricane Harvey back in 2017, including flood prone Houston, where up to a foot of rain could once again inundate streets and flood homes. What I can assure people in this city is that we are as ready for this storm as we could be for any storm. The Port of Houston closed. So are schools, medical facilities, COVID testing sites. To the east, a state of emergency in Louisiana. Forecasters warning of significant flooding along the coast where Hurricane Ida slammed ashore just over two weeks ago. It could drop heavy rain and cause flash flooding. Will only worsen scenes like you see behind me. But the Cajun Navy says they will be there through the rain that's coming and they will be there into the next disaster. The National Guard already in position with high water rescue vehicles, 23 boats and 15 aircraft. New Orleans is now under a flash flood watch through Thursday. I know that bracing for another storm while we're still responding to and trying to recover from Hurricane Ida is not the position that we wanted to be in, uh, but it is a situation that we are prepared for. It's more misery for the more than 100,000 customers in the state still without power after Ida. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, New York.
And here at home, NEISD is the latest victim of a cyber attack. District officials informed us of the breach that happened back in the end of August. According to the district, a payroll employee who handles wire transfers was hacked. The hackers tried to change the bank where the money was being wired. The district system notified them of the hack before any money could be transferred. However, that payroll has access to other employees' personal information. So district officials say they are unsure what other information the hackers accessed. About 5,000 employees, both current and past, were informed of the hack. In your morning headlines, the number of new COVID cases across the nation remains elevated. The latest numbers show more than a million children have tested positive for COVID in the past month. The U.S. now averaging six times as many as daily COVID deaths than just two months ago. Health experts say President Biden's vaccine mandate for workers and health professionals will help stop the spread. Meanwhile, down in Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis is threatening to sue cities in the state that have issued vaccine mandates for up to $5,000 per infraction. President Joe Biden is preparing to pitch his massive domestic spending package with a visit to a renewable energy lab in Colorado. Biden is highlighting how the investments in clean energy and his massive spending package will help combat climate change. Today's trip in Denver will cap off the president's two day swing to the west. He is expected to link the need to pass the massive spending package to the urgent threat posed by climate change. Biden did that yesterday when visiting areas of Idaho and California ravaged by wildfires. The Southeast, Southeastern Conference rather, has fined Arkansas $100,000 after Razorbacks fans rushed the field following their big win over the University of Texas. Fans violated the league's access to competition era, area a policy that was adopted back in 2004. Arkansas beat its former Southwest Conference opponent before a crowd of more than... And time now is 437 and it's about 70 degrees out there. Up next, free this week's high school football action as Wagner gets ready to face undefeated Smithson Valley. And taking a look outside with a live cam, a cooler start to your day in the 70s, but Nicholas not having too much of an effect here in our area. We'll be checking with Mike later on. It's 440. The big game in our big game covers this Friday night is a doozy. Wagner will face undefeated in the third ranked Smithson Valley at Ranger Stadium to kick off play in the difficult District 27 6A. The Thunderbirds come into the game with a 2 and 1 record, includes a huge win, or wins rather, against Stevens, 69 0. Laredo Alexander, 41 3, for a combined 110 points, only giving up three. Their only loss is to undefeated Johnson in their season opener, 21 13. The Rangers have been on a roll with dominating victors over Warren, Madison, and El Paso Eastwood, averaging 34 points a game. Now these two high school football powerhouses collide in their district opener. They have like a really confusing offense. That's all I really know. And they do a lot of like reverses in the backfield and stuff. A lot of power run and don't pass as much. So this year, uh, now that we've seen it, we should have a pretty good chance of stopping it. Then we went to overtime last year. They're a really good team. So. Yeah, we know what to expect from them. This game is, is really important because, you know, if we beat them, I mean, it really sets us up in a good position, you know, to keep going. And the momentum carrying from this game to a game like Steel and stuff like that, you know, it's really good. Kickoff at Smithson Valley is Friday night, 7 o'clock. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. All right, good news and bad news when it comes to the Cowboys. Unfortunately, more bad than good. Dallas has activated star offensive lineman Zach Martin off the COVID-19 Reserve list, but unfortunately they placed defensive end Randy Gregory in COVID protocol and it gets worse. Wide receiver Michael Gallup has been placed on injured reserve after suffering a calf strain during the Cowboys 31 29 loss to the Buccaneers last Thursday night, meaning he will have to miss at least the next three weeks before he can return sometime in October. After getting blown out by the Razorbacks in Arkansas, 40 to 21 Longhorns head coach Steve Sarkeesian is making a change at starting quarterback. Hudson Card out. Casey Thompson is in. It's after Card struggled against the Razorback, completed eight of 15 pass attempts for only 61 yards. His night was done in the third when he tried to scramble and Zach Williams knocked the ball out of his hand. That fumble would lead to a touchdown and an insurmountable 33-7 lead. Thompson would come into the game and lead the Longhorns on two scoring drives, but too little too late in the Horns' first loss of the season. We'll see if it works against Rice Saturday at 7 in Austin. 
Fighting Texas Aggies also making a QB change out of necessity, though. That's because Haynes King has a crack in his lower leg, according to the head coach, uh, repaired with surgery and will be out at least a month. But it happened the first quarter. The Aggies come back win against Colorado in Denver. King brought down by Colorado linebacker Guy Thomas. King would return to the field on crutches and is now out till mid-October. That means Zach Calzada is the Aggies' new starting quarterback. It's after leading the rude and white to the game-winning and only Aggie touchdown, an 18-yard pass to running back Isaiah Spiller to win the game 10-7. The narrow defeat of Colorado has dropped the Aggies to seventh in the latest AP college football poll. And that's a look at morning sports. Time now is 4.43 and it's about 70 degrees out there. Coming up next, parents are looking for clues after their 22-year-old daughter disappeared while on a cross-country adventure with her fiancé. And welcome back. It is 446. A family in New York is pleading for help in finding their daughter who disappeared while on a cross country trip visiting national parks with her boyfriend. ABC's Mona Kassar Abdi has the details in today's GMA First Look. In this morning's GMA First Look, cross country mystery. We don't know. We don't, we don't know where she is. Gabby Petito's family looking for any clues as to what happened to the 22 year old who was on a cross country adventure with her fiance when she disappeared. Petito was traveling the country in this van with her fiance, Brian Laundrie. A few days is one thing when you're out camping. When it starts to become seven, eight, nine, ten days, that's, that's a problem. I didn't know what to do. Laundrie at some point returned to the couple's home in Florida, but Petito was not with him. The FBI and police departments in New York and Florida all investigating. North Point Police Department saying they, quote, currently have no definitive information that a crime took place here, adding that the circumstances are odd. And we'll have the latest developments in this urgent search coming up at 7 a.m. With your GMA First Look, I'm Monaco Sarabdi, ABC News, New York. If you're trying to buy a new car this year, expect to pay more. Here's 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz on how to negotiate the price. Some vehicles are so hard to come by that buyers are paying well above sticker prices. Nationally, Consumer Reports has seen the Jeep Compass selling for 15% over MSRP, the Chevrolet Silverado 2500 17% over, and the 2021 Kia Telluride 18% over sticker. That's concerning buyers like Dan Barkyum. I just don't think I'm the best car buyer. <laughs> I'm not good at negotiating or anything like that. If you don't need a car right now, it can pay to wait until supplies are up and prices settle down. But what if you really do need a car right now? Consumer Reports advice, first choose a model that isn't in such high demand. And when you're ready to talk with the salesperson, be prepared to negotiate. Let the salesperson know that you've researched the transaction price for the car and trim level that you want. This means you know about what the dealer paid for it and have already calculated what you are prepared to pay. If they can meet your price, let them know you're prepared to buy immediately. If they can't, tell them you intend to shop other dealerships. The salesperson will try to keep the focus on your monthly payment. Insist on negotiating on one thing at a time. Lock in the price of your new car first. Then you can begin discussing a trade-in or financing. With the used car market also tight, expect at least wholesale pricing for your trade-in. Or you can always sell your car elsewhere like CarMax or Carvana. As for Dan, he found his car. It was all within the span of about 24 hours, but I think I would have shopped around a little bit more. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. 449. Let's go ahead and check in with Mike, who has a nice picture behind him. Beautiful picture. Yeah, I was going to, I was talking about that uh, car package there story. Uh, the whole chip thing is coming into play now because I guess a lot of cars are, they can't make them because they don't have those little tiny computer chips. It's, so. it's affected the market all yeah. year long so far. And uh, every time they think there's a sign of improvement, uh, they have another setback. So it continues to be a big problem. Yes, indeed. All right. Yeah, back to this picture. It is gorgeous there. Nicholas at sunset in Colorado County. 
Boy, it was pretty. We did get some rain from Hurricane Nicholas here in our area and of course down along the coast, but it did take a path a little further off to the east. So that, like I said, off to the top of the show has taken pretty much rain chances out of the picture and left us with some beautiful weather in behind. It's really pleasant when you step outside this morning. We're at 70 right now. That is the average normal low temperature, mid 60s in the hill country. And look at these dew point temperatures. There's still a hint of humidity out there, but these numbers have really dropped down compared to what they were yesterday because again, we got that dry air uh, coming in on the backside of Nicholas. There's nothing as far as any rain, just little spots around the, uh, the radar sites there. But off to the east, there is all the very heavy rain. Houston, of course, is getting a bunch of it and a lot more is expected for Louisiana, of course, on the heels of the hurricane just uh, what a couple of couple of weeks ago. Here's what some of the rainfall estimates are around Corpus Christi, two and a half inches of rain and then more heading up along the coast it's about seven inches just on the south side of Houston and then parts of the uh, well, right around Galveston area and then even these kind of darker purple areas close to nine, 10 inches of rain. Obviously it is not done. And then it was just sort of the scattered variety out there at the airport. It was a roughly an eighth of an inch of rain. It did barely make hurricane status right as it made landfall. And that was about uh, four hours ago when it officially made landfall. Again, a little further off to the, the east, the path was, and now it's back down to tropical storm strength, 70 mile per hour winds. It'll continue to lose strength as it moves way off to the uh, east end up to the uh, northeast and takes all that with it. Now, as far as us, we don't have anything as far as any rain in the forecast for the next couple of days, actually through the end of the week. Now going in toward the weekend, we're going to start to see a couple little disturbances in here. A few more clouds on Friday or excuse me on Saturday, perhaps a shower or two slightly better chance for uh, about a 30% chance for some showers coming in here by Sunday and then going into Monday as well. Also, temperatures are going to start to Make that incline going into the rest of the week. 82 degrees at noon today. Partly cloudy skies. I think we stay on a little bit below normal by a couple of notches. Partly cloudy 80 and kind of breezy. Wind out of the northeast at roughly 10, 20 miles per hour. Sort of on the backside of Nicholas. Tomorrow, 91. Still a few clouds around here. And then we get up into the mid 90s. So we'll be about five, six degrees or so above normal toward the end of the week. A few more clouds by the weekend. A couple of rain chances Sunday going into Monday. Well, not quite the forecast we were hoping for as we hit mid-September, but no, no. But at least today will be okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's going to be. It's, it's really nice out there this morning, so maybe some indications of cooler weather by the middle of next week. So okay, we'll and, see on that. So. And as you said, morning low may drop down to upper 60s, which would yeah. be kind of nice this mm -hmm. morning. I Very think so. Nice. Yes. Thank you, Mike. 452, about 70 degrees. And coming up next, encouraging news from actor Jeff Bridges, plus a first look at the newest season of The Morning Show. New cast members joined a popular show on Apple TV Plus, plus good news for actor Jeff Bridges. For the latest on what's happening in Hollywood, here's ABC's Jason Nathanson. There will be some new faces on the morning show this season. Hassan Minhaj joins the cast for season two, playing one of the new news anchors alongside Reese Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston. Minhaj, who you might know from The Daily Show or his own comedy news show, Patriot Act, hasn't done a lot of dramatic acting, telling me he was a little nervous, but he got some advice from Chris Rock that helped. He goes, man, you've been, you've been a fake TV anchor for the past damn near decade. He's like, you don't have to act. Everybody else has to act. Season two of The Morning Show premieres Friday on Apple TV+. Plus. Encouraging news from actor Jeff Bridges, revealing his cancer is in remission. We learned about his lymphoma diagnosis almost a year ago. Bridges writing on his website that his once large tumor has shrunk to the size of a marble. Bridges also revealing that he caught COVID earlier this year, which required a five-week hospital stay, and writes that the coronavirus hit him so hard the cancer was a piece of cake by comparison. The Sony studio stage where Alex Trebek hosted Jeopardy for decades. It will now forever be known as the Alex Trebek State. The show making that announcement during last night's season premiere. And Oscar winning actress Melissa Leo with a birthday today. She's 61. And that's what's happening in Hollywood. I'm Jason Nathanson, ABC News, Los Angeles. It is now three minutes till five, about 70 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA, as the effort to get people vaccinated continues, some states are threatening to sue cities that have issued vaccine mandates. Still ahead, a security issue prompting Apple to send out an important update to iPhones. We have details in your morning tech bites. 
And ahead on GMSA at 6, our Tejano Moments series continues. We're going to tell you how a Texas historical figure earned her nickname. And checking Trans Guide, a familiar face is back on GMSA this morning. Samuel King is in for Stephen. We'll talk to him coming up at the top of the hour. Nicholas moving into the Galveston and Houston area this morning. This is a live look. What a mess this morning. Folks out on the roads and the rain is going sideways. Mike will have an update coming up. Millions of students across the country are back in classrooms. I'm Alex Pache in Washington. Coming up, why some experts worry about a fall COVID surge. And taking a look outside with live cam this morning, a cold start to your day and expecting uh, pretty decent temperatures even throughout the afternoon. And a good morning to you. It's Tuesday, September 14th. Thanks for joining us this morning. Before we get to weather, we have some late breaking news. A crash on I-35 near West Pyron Avenue. Katrina Weber is live there now with the very latest. Well, good morning, Stephanie and Mark. Uh, this is actually uh, on the access road of I-35 near West Pyron. It's a bicyclist who was hit. The scene's still very active. We have traffic investigators here. This happened right before five o'clock, uh, four o'clock rather. Uh, police tell us that a man was on his bicycle on this sidewalk riding, but he was carrying a duffel bag and a television. He lost his balance, fell onto the access road where he was hit by a car. Uh, the man was with uh, his girlfriend at the time. She was on another bicycle riding behind him, but she told police she did not see the car that hit her boyfriend, uh, so she was not able to give a description. That car kept going. Driver took off, so police don't have much to go on in terms of who hit this bicyclist, but the man who was hit was taken to a hospital uh, with non-life-threatening injuries, so that is a, a bit of good news that he wasn't seriously hurt, according to police, but they are still investigating to try to get whatever clues they can about the driver who hit him and then took off. Reporting live on the south side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Thank you very much, Katrina. And all right, this morning it is uh, fairly pleasant. We're getting some drier air moving in here on the back side of Nicholas. And look at the dew point temperature. That bottom number there is down to 63, much lower than what it was yesterday. And temperatures at 69 degrees out there at the airport, which is actually just a notch below what you would expect this time of year. We're going to be uh, warming up nicely throughout the day, but only making up to 88, which is still slightly below average. And I don't think there's going to be any complaints there. A little bit of a breeze out of the northeast later on today. The aquifer dropped down one tenth of a foot in the past uh, 24 hours on yesterday's reading and mold is moderate. Same thing with fall elm. Ragweed is on the low side. There is nothing showing up on radar officially out at the airport. We picked up uh, just about an eighth of an inch of rain yesterday with one of those outer bands that moved on through here and then all the rain kind of got out of the picture and that's because this took a little a track a little further to the east than what was initially forecast is the initially the initial track I should say and obviously it's a big rain producer most of the rain is well off to the east but they've had plenty of it around Houston and then all along the Texas coast lesser amounts down in toward uh, Corpus Christi as far as our weather mostly cloudy very pleasant this morning it's going to stay pretty pleasant throughout the day kind of breezy like I said upper 80s for high temperature and then the rest of the week mostly sunny it is going to start to heat up. We're going to make it up into the mid 90s. We do have another small rain chance coming in here later on in the weekend. More on that in just a couple of minutes. Well, yesterday morning, of course, Justin Horn went down to the coast to check out the very latest on Nicholas. Here's what he has. It's in the dark after tropical storm Nicholas pounded this area with strong winds and we're still seeing gusty winds, heavy rain and storm surge. We estimated a wind gust around 70 miles per hour, maybe a little bit higher here in town, and that was enough to do some damage. Take a look at this tree here behind me, completely toppled, a large tree laying across the road. There's more damage around town. Obviously, power lines are down. That's why most are without power here. And I think as folks wake up, they're going to find that there is probably more damage here around the city of Fort O'Connor. We did talk to one resident and we asked him what he was worried about. Pretty heavy wind and I've been through for several like this, but the wind is what's pretty bad right now in the rain. The biggest concern with my boat and a lot of other boats, my cousin over there, they have uh, boats in the water, but we got them all taken out. But, you know, for right now, we're just going to ride it out and see what happens. 
It seems a lot of the damage was localized to right here in Port O'Connor and along Matagorda Bay as this system now is moving east and northeast. It's going to bring a lot of rain to parts of southeast Texas, but here in Port O'Connor, they should be able to do some cleaning up as uh, this system moves away and conditions improve. Reporting for GMSA in Port O'Connor, Justin Horn, KSAT 12 News. A lot calmer in this area when it comes uh, to traffic. Good morning, everybody. I'm Samuel King, and for Stephen this morning, this is a look at 35 and uh, State Highway 46 up in the New Braunfels area. Things uh, flowing well, but as we head over here uh, to the wall, want to show you some delays there on 35. Stephen told you about these yesterday here. These are northbound, so if you're coming from 410 to New Braunfels, 21 minutes, 19 minutes in the other direction. Uh, Katrina mentioned that crash there on the south side near 35 and South Cross. That's in the access. This road 35 looks OK this morning. Looking at our wheel of time, 26 minutes if you're coming in from New Braunfels on 35, 16 minutes in the Lytle area, 24 minutes on I-10 from Bernie. We'll have another traffic update coming up in just a little bit. Mark, Stephanie. Hey, Bill, thank you. Good to see you, sir. Now that many kids are back in class, there's a lot of anxiety over the Delta variant, especially with children under 12 still not able to get a vaccine. ABC's Alex Brashe has the latest from Washington. With in-person classes now in session for millions of students across the country, concerns over a fall Delta COVID surge are growing. More than 243,000 children tested positive for COVID-19 last week, the second highest case week ever. One million children across the country have tested positive for COVID in the last month. Doctors saying those numbers will likely continue to rise. Yes, we are going to see a slight uptick just because more exposure and also this Delta variant is a little bit more stickier than the Alpha variant we saw last year. The country now averaging 1,200 deaths a day, six times the death toll two months ago. Just days after President Biden announced his sweeping strategy to mandate vaccinations, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis says he'll fine Florida cities that have issued vaccine mandates up to $5,000 per infraction. We are going to protect Florida jobs. We are not going to let people be fired because of a vaccine mandate. One school district there has already reversed a mask mandate for students after a judge ruled in favor of the governor's ban on mask mandates. Parents can now opt their children out of wearing a face covering. Meanwhile, in Iowa, Des Moines Public Schools will reinstate a mask mandate after a federal judge's ruling. That mandate will take effect tomorrow. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. And time now is 5.07 and it's about 69 degrees out there. Still ahead, why Apple's encouraging people to up their, update their iPhones as soon as possible. And as more people head out to football games this season, how stadiums are trying to protect people against the coronavirus. Outside with live cam, the upside on being on the backside of a major storm system in the western Gulf of Mexico and parts of East Texas, we are seeing drier air in the area, so it's actually kind of nice out there this morning here in South Central Texas. We'll be right back. Football on the college and professional level is back in action this fall, and so are packed stadiums. Some health experts worry crowded sports stadiums amid the pandemic can be a bad idea. Sarah Costa breaks down what some stadiums are doing to protect fans. Health experts say this fall's crowded college and professional football stadiums could create ripe conditions for COVID-19 to spread among unvaccinated fans. According to the Associated Press, many football stadiums aren't requiring fans to wear masks or be vaccinated. The chances of a fan being exposed will depend on where the stadium is and whether the game is outdoors, among the other factors. Experts say the single biggest way to manage the risks before attending a game is to get fully vaccinated. Most football stadiums hold anywhere from 65,000 to 100,000 fans. Ryan Demmer, an epidemiologist at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, says at any sort of large event like a football stadium, without question, there will be many infected people there. The NFL doesn't have a blanket policy for masks or vaccination status for fans. That creates a patchwork of guidelines developed by each of the 32 teams. The Las Vegas Raiders require proof of vaccination for all fans 12 and over. The New Orleans Saints and Seattle Seahawks require fans to show proof of vaccination or a negative COVID-19 test. Dr. Sharon Wright, a chief infection prevention officer at Beth Israel Leahy Health in Boston, says 
Wearing masks and using hand sanitizer at the game, also a good idea. The highly contagious Delta variant has triggered a summer surge in infections. The seven-day rolling average for daily cases in the U.S. sits at about 150,000 after starting September above 167,000. That's according to Johns Hopkins University. LSU, Oregon, Oregon State, and Tulane have announced proof of vaccination requirements starting with their home openers. Next month, LSU will allow unvaccinated fans the option of showing proof of a negative COVID-19 test in the previous 72 hours. Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. Right now it's 513, 69 degrees. And still ahead, why Facebook is reportedly exempting some users from content rules. An ex-Apple co-founder launching his own space company. We'll see what's up with Steve Wozniak. We're for those who love to discover, who know an open mind is the only kind, who are their own personal stylist, who know where to escape, even just for a moment, who don't need a fortune to find a gem, and who know when you spend less, you can discover even more and never, ever stop discovering. Spend less, discover more at TJ Maxx. Feel the clarity of non-drowsy Claritin and 24-hour relief from symptoms caused by over 200 indoor and outdoor allergens. Try Claritin Cool Mint Chewables for powerful allergy relief plus a cooling sensation. Live Claritin clear. Look at these mighty Quaker Oats. Small in size, epic in taste, heart healthy, a good source of fiber, and provides lasting energy. There's no denying delicious Quaker Oats are the grain of all time. Quaker Oats, a super trusted superfood. Apple urging iPhone and iPad users to update their software to correct a spyware flaw. ABC's Andrew Dimbert has details in today's Tech Bytes. In today's Tech Bytes, Apple's urgent warning. The company is imploring people to download an emergency software update, which fixes a flaw that could allow spyware to unknowingly be installed on iPhones, iPads, Apple Watches, and Mac computers. Meanwhile, Apple holds an annual event today to unveil a new line of phones. A new report says Facebook keeps a list of profiles that are immune to the company's rules, allowing posts that would otherwise be taken down. According to the Wall Street Journal, the program includes 5 million politicians, celebrities and journalists. The company insists it previously disclosed the program and says it was developed to give certain accounts a quote second layer of review. Finally, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak has joined the private space race. He's behind a new company, Privateer Space, which promises to keep space safe and accessible to all humankind. Those are your Tech Bytes. Have a great day. Just about 518. Go ahead and check in with Samuel King this morning. Good morning, Mark and Stephanie. Good to be back with you and everyone else uh, this morning. <laughs> Things looking uh, okay on the roads uh, right now. Just a few problem spots here. This is I-10 at Heatner uh, this morning. You can kind of see the traffic flowing well, starting to build a little bit. So let's take a look at how that's looking inside uh, Loop 1604 there on I-10. Well, first from Bernie, actually, 25 minutes each direction, so that looks good. And then again, once you're inside 1604, 12 minutes each direction, so things looking fine there. Uh, Katrina had told you at the top of the hour about this crash here. This is on the frontage road there on I-35 uh, southbound there, so it's not affecting the main lanes of 35. But we do have some slowdowns here in Comal County here on 35 heading uh, northbound. And so about a three mile slowdown there in the orange. There was some uh, some sort of work uh, overnight and there's still some residual delays there. But again, I attended Heapner things looking fine this morning, everybody. Thank you, Samuel. It is great to have you with us this morning. Yeah, good to see you again and good to see that beautiful are, picture behind you. I was going to say, are you awake, though? <laughs> I, I'm awake right, right now. Ask me in an hour. I was gonna say. Yeah, he's awake. Samuel would say that's not a prerequisite for working this shift. Guys, no. You're awake. We and just we're glad to have you. Sleepwalk our way through it, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. It was a beautiful picture from uh, Mr. McClellan over there, looking over Woodlawn Lake and some of the leftover clouds. We had obviously some rain from Nicholas here in town, and then all that the the storm kind of shifted a little further to the east, and it took a, everything with it basically, and now left us with 
with some pretty nice weather this morning. It's very comfortable out there. We do have some clouds though hanging around the the dew points, the measure moisture in the atmosphere, and this is how we figure out relative humidity. These numbers went down um, anywhere from say five, six, seven, almost 10 degrees compared to this time yesterday. So that much drier air and it doesn't take a lot. Just a few degrees makes a whole lot of difference and you know down seven degrees out there at the airport and that's why it is so comfortable and it's because we've got this kind of northerly flow. So here's the storm over there right around Houston. And this is on the back side of it, if you will, that circulation coming in here out of the north. So that's going to keep the humidity in check throughout the day. It won't be bone dry air, but it will be tolerable. It will come up a little bit tomorrow morning and then drop somewhat in the afternoon. And then we may kind of uh, flirt with a little more humidity as the storm gets on out of here. The flow kind of comes back in here from the southeast as we go in toward maybe the middle portion of the week. And also things are going to start to warm up a little bit as we go in toward the middle portion of the week. So Nicholas, which did did barely become a hurricane. Winds got up to 75 miles per hour, which 74 is the threshold for a hurricane right before it made landfall. And that was about four and a half hours ago, excuse me, about almost five hours ago now. And uh, this morning, 70 mile per hour winds right now, and it is moving off to the north northeast, and it will continue that direction. And here's the perfect example where as we always talk about the heaviest rain is on the right hand side of the storm in relation to its direction of travel. And that's definitely the case. So going to be just getting so soaked throughout a good chunk of Louisiana with this storm. And here's another look at radar with all of that rain picked up about anywhere from say half a foot to a foot or more. And it's not done yet over there around Houston and east of there. So there's the storm. It will continue to work to the northeast, sort of fizzle on out. The high pressure is going to take over. It's not going to be sitting right on top of us, but just enough to help to heat things up and that's going to be the case in through the rest of the week. Now, by the weekend, there may be a couple of disturbances trying to slide on in here, just little glitches in the atmosphere. So a couple of showers are going to be possible by maybe some Saturday, but more likely Sunday, Monday. Not a great chance, but just a small chance for it. And then uh, what's going to be interesting, and I know this is still a week or so away, but looks like a pretty decent trough is going to try and slide through here by the middle part of next week. And perhaps a uh, fairly decent front associated with that by the middle of next week. <laughs> you see the look on Mark's face right now. <laughs> anyway, 82 degrees. <laughs> hold that hold that pose for the three shot. Uh, 82 degrees today at noon, partly cloudy skies. High temperature today up to 88. It's going to be kind of breezy wind out of the northeast at uh, 10, 20 miles per hour. Humidity is going to be okay, so a fairly pleasant day today. And then tomorrow we're going to start to creep back up into the 90s and getting about, well, anywhere five, six, seven degrees above normal by the end of the week. Hopefully a couple of rain chances by late in the weekend and the first of next week. What he said was trough. What he meant was cold front the kind that makes you grin yeah so we'll see that be middle of next week next though. Week. The middle, yeah the middle of next week so yeah. i mean a lot happens between now and then right. but there are those sure. signs you know we're right. hopeful we, we get teased and then teased and the one you know, finally <laughs> yeah. comes through here so. and we've been hurt before but uh we understand it's getting closer <laughs> to fall so are we talking weather here or is this, you know, you're going off on a tangent i think so 523 <laughs> about 69 degrees and up next in your morning spotlight, two Hawkeye characters headed to Disney Plus and an Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden achieves a career milestone. 526 Disney Plus has unveiled its first look at the Hawkeye streaming series. CNN's Rick Damagella has the story in the Hollywood Minute. You can't outrun. Former heavyweight boxer Florian Muntianu co-stars in current box office champ Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, which was a career goal for the fighter turned actor. I always wanted to be a superhero or play in the MCU. Actually, when I made uh, the first steps into the film industry, that was like a long-term goal of mine. I just thought that I would need a little bit longer, but here we are. This is the first Christmas we've had together years. I love you guys. I'm making up for some lost time. More news from the MCU as Disney Plus has released a first look at Hawkeye. The streaming series will feature two characters who've used the Hawkeye name, Jeremy Renner's Clint Barton and Haley Steinfeld as Kate Bishop. Hawkeye is on target to premiere November 24th. A 
milestone for Iron Maiden. The heavy metal band have scored their highest Billboard charting album of their more than four-decade career. Senjutsu, the band's 17th album, bowed at number three on the Billboard 200 chart. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. 527, about 69 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA, Senate Democrats are back in Washington now. We're going to tell you why they're not anywhere close to reaching a deal on the president's spending package. And if you're looking for an easy way to pay for college, we have a list of companies offering huge benefits to student workers. And we're going to tell you how educated San Antonio residents are compared to the rest of the U.S. Suicide prevention, always an important topic to discuss, but especially in the midst of a worldwide health pandemic. Ahead on GMSA at 6, later this morning, the effect the coronavirus is having on our youth. Here's a live look right now at Galveston, Texas, and it's been like this all morning long. We see emergency crews out and about. Not many other folks on the road right now, and that's for good reason. We started looking at high winds and a ton of rain. It's been blowing sideways for the last hour or so. And here at home, a cool, calm start to your day. We're at 69 degrees, and we're going to be checking in with Mike to see how your day is going to shape up. And we're excited because Samuel King is in the house this morning handling traffic duties. Good to have him back on the morning show right now. It's 531 and it's Tuesday the 14th. Thanks for joining us this morning. We're going to check in with Samuel shortly, but for now we're going to check in with Mike to see how our week will look. Oh, it's going to start to warm up as the week goes on. This morning it's really nice out there on the backside. Uh, refer to it as the backside of the uh, the what is now once again a tropical storm Nicholas. It did reach hurricane strength very briefly before it made landfall. Anyway, 69 degrees right now. The dew points at 63, so the air has dried out considerably, especially compared to yesterday. Wind is out of the north primarily at about uh, six or so miles per hour. It is going to be on the breezy side later on today. Here's what it looks like on radar. There's nothing being picked up in our area. We, of course, had a few of those showers, about an eighth of an inch of rain out at the airport yesterday, but this took a path further to the east. It's still working its way almost straight up to the north, made landfall about five hours ago, and we had, like I said, a few of those uh, showers yesterday, but with that further east path, it took all the rain with it and now has left us with much drier air in place and fairly comfortable weather. Mold and fall elm are both on the moderate side. Ragweed is low and throughout the rest of today, 82 degrees at noon. Partly cloudy skies, 88. Again, kind of breezy out of the northeast and temperatures will stay just a couple of notches below normal. But like I said, the trend this week is going to be to warm up a little bit. Maybe some rain down the road. Details in just a couple of minutes. Right now, Traffic Authority, the man, the myth, the legend. You haven't heard that intro in a while, have you, Sam? No, Mike. Good morning to you. Good morning, everyone out there. Here's a look at 281 at uh, San Pedro. Thank you, Mike, and everyone for a warm welcome this morning. Uh, things looking fine in that area as we head over here to the uh, big wall. You can see traffic flowing well. Going a little north of there, north of 1604 on 281. If you are heading to work or school, things looking fine there. Six minutes in each direction between Bulverde Road and 1604. Remember, you can use HOV lanes if you carpool or if you have multiple people in your vehicle in that area. Rest of the area looking fine. Just noticing this here on uh, State Highway 151. We'll take a look at that uh, in our next update there. And looking at some travel times from around the region. 25 minutes if you're coming in from New Braunfels on 35. 25 minutes all the way in from Bulverde on 281. 28 minutes on I-10 from Seguin. We'll have another update coming up. Thank you, Samuel. New this morning, traffic investigators have been looking for whatever clues they can find after a crash on the south side. They are hoping to track down a driver who kept going after hitting a man on a bicycle. It happened on the access road of I-35 near West Pyron. Katrina Weber is there with a live report. And Katrina, have police made any headway? Well, no arrests so far, but uh, they did spend quite a bit of time going through the evidence that was here at the scene. They were, we saw them actually uh, collecting some information from some of the car parts that were left behind, so it's possible they do have some important clues. Now, they have cleared the scene, but we have some video to show you uh, from earlier this morning. This crash happened just before 4 o'clock this morning. Police say a man on a bicycle who was riding down the sidewalk carrying a duffel bag and a television lost his balance, fell onto the access road where he was hit by a car. The car that hit him kept going, and that is the one police are looking for at this time. Now, the man was with his girlfriend who was on another bicycle just behind him, but she told police she didn't actually get a good look at the car, so she was not able to provide them 
with any description of that vehicle or the driver. The man who was hit by the car was taken to a hospital. Police say his injuries were not life-threatening, but again, they are on a mission to track down the driver who hit him and kept going. Reporting live on the South Side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Katrina. Lawmakers in Washington have a big to-do list ahead of them, and Democrats say their top priority right now is the president's two-part spending package. The bipartisan infrastructure package has already passed in the Senate. However, as Britt Conway reports, getting across the finish line will not be easy. Senate Democrats are back on the Hill and back to battling it out over the $3.5 trillion budget bill. Democratic leaders say they want the deal hammered out by Wednesday, and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has promised to bring it to the floor by the 27th. Bipartisan backing is unlikely, but under budget reconciliation, the bill can pass with just 50 Democratic votes. Problem is, the centerpiece of the president's agenda is stalling within his own party. One of the major issues, the price tag. I'm looking for a competitive tax break, okay? I want to make the adjustments and changes. One, one and a half, we don't know where it's going to be. Others say that's not nearly enough. When we increase job training programs, when we increase child care, people will get back to work. We've got to lower the cost of prescription drugs for people. We've got to expand Medicare to include dental, hearing aids, and eyeglasses. We have to maintain the $300 direct payment we're giving to working parents. But there still isn't a consensus over those health care provisions or climate provisions. Not to mention the debate over the tax hikes on the wealthy and corporations to pay for it all. The way you, that a compromise will most likely take place will be on how long these programs will be in place, uh, how large the programs will be. Uh, but the different components are pretty well um, supported at this point. I'm Britt Conway reporting. In other headlines this morning, get ready for the new iPhone. The Apple's expected to make the announcement of four new phones at a virtual event today. They include the iPhone 13, the 13 mini, as well as the iPhone 13 Pro and Pro Max. The devices will reportedly have improved 5G chips, 5G chips rather, longer battery life, and an updated camera system. The phones are also expected to have a faster refresh rate for improved gaming. Apple will also likely unveil the new Apple Watch and the next generation AirPod 3. More than 10,000 Transportation Security Administration workers have tested positive for COVID since the beginning of the pandemic. The TSA says more than four in every five employees who tested positive worked at airport security checkpoints. Of the 65% of workers who responded to an agency-wide survey, 72% said they are fully vaccinated. The TSA also says 26 workers have died after contracting the virus. The data on test results could change, however. Workers have until October 1st to respond to that survey. 537, about 69 degrees. Do you need a little extra cash? We're going to tell you what companies are hiring heading into the holiday season. Outside, a rather up next, seems like the best way to pay for college these days is to go to work for specific companies. We'll tell you the latest ones dealing out big money for your higher education. And taking a quick peek outside with the live cam, it is 69 degrees and actually feeling pretty nice. If you have a chance, step outside and enjoy it. We'll be right back. Welcome back, 540. Amazon joining a growing list of retailers offering educational benefits to its employees. The online retailer now offering it to cover 100% of the cost of tuition. And as CNN's Jen Sullivan explains, this is a new trend in retail. One, two, three, Amazon! Free tuition delivered by Amazon. The e-commerce giant is joining a growing list of retailers offering educational benefits to its employees. I think that this is a positive approach. It's going to potentially attract stronger workers. Starting in January, Amazon says it will pay the full cost of college tuition including books and fees for any of its 750,000 hourly U.S. employees wanting to pursue associates or bachelor's degrees. They didn't graduate from college yet, um, but that is definitely one of my goals in the near future. The online retailer isn't the only U.S. company offering these types of perks. Amazon's competitors, like Walmart and Target, had previously announced similar programs. Last month, Target rolled out a program that covers the cost of undergrad degrees at select schools. And in July, Walmart announced it would pay 100% of college tuition for Walmart and Sam's Club's associates. They may end up just competing against each other for more and more benefits and wages for the same 
uh, shrinking pool of workers. Amazon's announcement comes as retailers around the country face challenges hiring employees to staff stores and warehouses. Economists say dangling these types of perks is directly in response to the tight job market. They say it will help retain and attract more hourly employees. This is a way for them to compete without necessarily having to raise wages as much as they would. For today's Consumer Watch, I'm Jen Sullivan. And time now is 542 and it's about 69 degrees out there. Next, find out where San Antonio ranks in education compared to the rest of the U.S. And welcome back. It's 545 in your morning consumer headlines. Good news for people looking to pick up some extra pay during the holiday season. Several major employers are looking for seasonal workers among the companies posting tens of thousands of positions. The U.S. Postal Service, Kohl's and Michaels. These retailers say they expect strong holiday sales and need people. However, some companies may have trouble filling in all these job vacancies. Data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics say there was a record 10.9 million openings during the month of July. The company behind the hit video game Fortnite is pushing ahead with its legal fight against Apple. Epic Games is planning to appeal a recent decision after a federal judge ruled that Apple had to give developers the ability to offer other ways for customers to pay besides through the App Store. But the judge rejected Epic's allegations that Apple's App Store is a monopoly. How educated are San Antonio residents compared to, say, the rest of the country? A new study takes a look at the U.S. Census data to compare cities across the country based on the amount of people who completed higher levels of education. Sarah Costa shows us where San Antonio ended up on the list. Research indicates that states in the northern U.S. have significantly higher levels of education than states in the south. Using a composite scoring system based on how many years of education a state's over 25 population had, researchers at Higher Help were found that Massachusetts had the nation's highest level of education, followed by Colorado, Vermont, and New Hampshire. Notably, not a single state south of Virginia ranked in the top 20. To identify which cities have the highest levels of education, researchers at Higher Helper analyzed Census Bureau data and calculated a composite score from 0 to 100 based on the average number of years of education residents completed. For example, someone who finished high school was considered to have completed 12 years of education, whereas someone who earned a bachelor's degree was considered to have completed 16 years. Only cities with 100,000 or more people were included in the study. Additionally, to improve relevance, cities were grouped into cohorts based on population. Small cities, 100,000 to 149,000. Mid-city, 150,000 to 349,000. And large cities, 350,000 or more. The study shows San Antonio residents averaged 12.6 years of education, compared to 13.4 years for Americans on average. Overall, 16.4% of San Antonio residents' highest level of attainment is a bachelor's degree, and 9.6% attain a graduate or professional degree. Out of all large U.S. cities, San Antonio is the 12th least educated. So what large city ranked on top? Seattle, Washington ranks as the most educated large city in the U.S. with an average of 15.3 years of education. The city to come in second place, Washington, D.C. at 15.1 average years of education. Despite San Antonio's low ranking, one Texas city not too far north of us did make the top 10 list of the most educated large cities in the U.S. Our state capital, Austin, came in at number nine with an average of 14.3 years of education. I'm Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. 548. Let's go ahead and check in with Samuel King. I was looking at Loop 410 and Marbuck Road. Looks like things are moving kind of slow there. Yeah, moving uh, kind of slow. Traffic starting to build a little bit. They had some construction there overnight as well. You can see some of the signs there as we head over here to uh, the uh, big wall this morning. Traffic starting to build as people head to work in school this morning. Definitely a lot busier than the last time I was here on the morning show. Uh, we told you about some delays on, say, Highway 151. Those are gone now. So normal time between Highway 90 and Loop 1604, eight minutes uh, heading west, uh, nine minutes heading east from 1604 to Highway 90. 
90. The rest of the area looking fine right now, and even those delays there on 35 near the Comal Guadalupe County line have sort of cleared out. So now if it's a good time, if you want to head out, maybe pick up something before uh, you head to your destination this morning, now would be a good time to do so when we have green all over the map. This is 410 at Marbach. Let's take a look one more. I'm not even going to look. We're just going to press the button. 410 at Broadway. <laughs> Didn't quite go too far there, but you can see there on the north side, things also looking fine this morning. We, we're going to call that Samuel's surprise pick. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's almost like a, a high tech version of pin the tail on the donkey. It kind yeah. of is. Yeah. And, of, and it worked out. Yes. Okay, one, one more, Sam. Just close your eyes okay, and, and pick it. Let's see what we have. Right. And today's okay, winner is. Here you go. I-35 right. at <laughs> way out Highway 46. Yeah, all the way in Kamau County, New Braunfels. There's a new game we can play. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Guess thank the trans guy. <laughs> anyway, thank you, sir. Beautiful picture from uh, yesterday. Yeah, some folks only got a little bit of drizzle out at the airport, about an eighth of an inch of rain. There was that one band that moved through just after noon and right around noon, and then things started to uh, clear up. But what a cool looking picture. Thank you very much for that one. Uh, nice start this morning. We do have some clouds, pleasant temperatures though. And uh, right now we are at 69 at the airport, 61 Kerrville, Rock Springs 64 and uh, low 60 also Fredericksburg at 62 degrees right now. We did get some drier air that came on in on the backside of this storm and it did take a path. It, it had looked like it was going to be making landfall. Uh, say about Matagorda Bay, but it moved a little further off to the east and actually didn't make landfall until right after uh, midnight this morning, about 1230 and still Packing a punch, obviously, back down to tropical storm strength. It did briefly reach 75 miles per hour, so it became officially in the record books a hurricane momentarily. 70 mile per hour winds continuing to move off to the northeast at 9 miles per hour. And of course, all of the rain, the majority of it, is on the right hand side in relation to its uh, direction of travel, which is why we had limited rain. We just had some of those wraparound uh, rain bands that move through here. And it's going to continue to work its way off to the north and then make a shift almost straight to the east covering a good chunk of Louisiana. So it's the Gulf Coast and that's going to be obviously fed by the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf Coast is going to be getting a lot more rain from Nicholas. So another look at radar and yeah, it's some it's some pretty good rain. They've already picked up about oh say two and a half, three inches down around Corpus Christi and then continue to increase further up the coast and some of the rainfall estimates nine inches close to a foot of rain in around the, the Houston area. We've got a few clouds hanging around here right now and other than Nicholas, notice how most everything up to the north is moving just about straight west to east. That's uh, kind of a zonal pattern in the in the atmosphere, which means temperatures are going to be staying at or a little bit above normal. That'll be the case in through the rest of the week and then going into the weekend will actually, like I said, be uh, on the warm side of things. However, it looks like a pretty good kink in that flow is going to be coming on in here. Pretty good dip of trough moving through at least long range projections, some of them by the middle part of next week, which could mean a fairly significant front moving through here next week. 82 degrees today at noon, partly cloudy skies. High temperature then makes it up to 88, so just a couple of notches below normal and pretty nice northeasterly wind about 10 20 miles per hour tomorrow back up into normal more normal range or a little bit above that and then mid 90s by the end of the week. So it's going to be pretty hot by the end of the week. A few more clouds this weekend, couple of showers possibly on Sunday or excuse me on Saturday, slightly better chance Sunday and Monday. We will keep our fingers crossed for next week. Yeah, we'll wait and see if that one uh, kind of holds true. So if long range models are consistent with that one. If Mike was a poker player, those cards are way up here. <laughs> He's not even going to tip them the slightest bit right now. It's too early because you have to know when to hold them. And no one to fold them. Hold them. 553, about 69 degrees. No wind to, <laughs> no wind to run. All right, uh, pick three. We have 269, Fireball 4, Daily 4, 0573, Fireball 2. We are so about to get a dirty email from Kenny Rogers. <laughs> uh, cash 5 numbers 10, 17, 27, 29, 35. Texas 2 steps 7, 23, 26, 33. Bonus ball of 3. Glad you're with us this morning. We'll be right back.
Whether they're puffy, street style for breakfast, San Antonio knows tacos. Tonight's brand new episode of KSAT Explains is all about the taco culture in our city, the history, evolution, and important of it all to our city's identity. KSAT Explains San Antonio's taco culture will be available to stream on demand starting at 7 p.m. on KSAT.com, uh, the KSAT TV app, and our Facebook page. If you can't watch it live, we'll post the full episode so you can watch it on demand later tonight. Ahead in the next hour, GMSA SpaceX has successfully launched a rocket from the West Coast into space. We'll have more on that. Apple rolling out an emergency software update for iPhones. We'll tell you why. And a man's in the hospital after he was hit by a vehicle while he was riding a bicycle. Police are still looking for that driver. We'll have the latest on that. Samuel King is in for Stephen today, tracking traffic over in the traffic lab. The sun is starting to come up, but we'll get the update on Nicholas as well. Very heavy rain in southeast Texas as we speak. We'll be right back. Right now, you're looking live. This is Galveston, and the rain has been flying sideways in what's left of Nicholas all morning long. Folks are still out and about, though. They're out there at Galveston. And a lot calmer here at home, taking a look outside with live cam this morning. A cool, pleasant start to your day, but Mike's talking about things heating up later this week. Live from Case at 12, Good Morning San Antonio starts right now. And a good morning to you. It is Tuesday, September 14th. Thank you for joining us this morning. If you have some time, go ahead and step outside. It's kind of nice out there. Yes, and Mike says that's actually due in part to Nicholas, uh, which continues to march inland. Uh, the thing I was surprised by this morning, Mike, was the fact that it briefly reached hurricane status. Yeah, it went up to 75 miles per hour right as it was about to make landfall. So 74 is the, the threshold mm -hmm. when it becomes a tropical storm. Oh, yeah, the difference between the two, I should say. Uh, yeah, it did make land. It moved a little further. The path was a little further to the east than and what it had looked like yesterday, which is why, yes, we did get some rain here briefly yesterday. And then things started to clear on out. And yeah, we've got, uh, you know, some great weather in behind it right now. We've got uh, a few clouds hanging around here. And there is, this is the water vapor imagery. There is Nicholas well off to the east of us. And it's pulling in this drier air, not only upstairs in the atmosphere, but also down here at the surface. So it is more comfortable when you step outside. Here's a live look at radar right now. And all of the very heavy rain picked up anywhere from, say, nine inches to a foot or more and they're going to be getting a bunch of it, obviously, there in uh, Louisiana. Mold and Fall Elm are all on the low side, and, or excuse me, on the moderate side. Ragweed is low. Temperatures throughout the rest of today, we are in the upper 60s right now, so just a couple of degrees below normal, and then we're going to be uh, warming up nicely throughout the day. We'll gain about 20 when it's all said and done. We'll make it into the low 80s today at noon. Still a few clouds around here. Bit of a breeze out of the northeast at 10 to 20 miles per hour, so that's going to help out with the somewhat dry drier air over the next uh, over the course of the afternoon and 88 for a high temperature later on today. Of course, Justin Horn went down to the uh, coast and he's been in Porto counter tracking Nicholas and here's what he has been seeing down there. Porto Connor is in the dark after tropical storm Nicholas pounded this area with strong winds and we're still seeing gusty winds, heavy rain and storm surge. We estimated a wind gust around 70 miles per hour, maybe a little bit higher here in town, and that was enough to do some damage. Take a look at this tree here behind me. Completely toppled, a large tree laying across the road. There's more damage around town. Obviously, power lines are down. That's why most are without power here. And I think as folks wake up, they're gonna find that there is probably more damage here around the city of Port O'Connor. We did talk to one resident, and we asked him what he was worried about. Pretty heavy wind. Like this, but the wind is what's pretty bad right now, and the rain. The biggest concern was my boat and a lot of other boats. My cousin over there, they have uh, boats in the water, but we got them all taken out. But you know, for right now, we're just going to ride it out and see what happens. It seems a lot of the damage was localized to right here in Port O'Connor and along Matagorda Bay as this system now is moving east and northeast. It's going to bring a lot of rain to parts of southeast Texas, but here in Port O'Connor, they should be able to do some cleaning up as uh, this system moves away and conditions improve. Reporting for GMSA in Port O'Connor, Justin Horn, KSAT 12 News.
Thank you very much, Justin. Things a lot calmer in this area than they are in Houston. We do know that there are some traffic issues over there as well as transit service there is suspended because of the storm. Let's take a look at some travel times here in our area. 24 minutes are coming eastbound on I-10 from Bernie. 27 minutes from the north from Bulverde on 281. 26 minutes coming in from New Braunfels on I-35. This is I-10 at Hebner. Things flowing well there and let's take a look here at the map things still looking pretty uh, green not too much going on just a few maybe some delays there on 35 coming out of new braunfels we'll have another update on traffic coming up in just a few minutes mark stephanie thank you sammy good to see you new this morning san antonio police are looking for the driver who hit a man on a bicycle it happened around four this morning on the south side near 35 and west pyron avenue that's where officers say the man in his 30s was riding his bike on a sidewalk but veered in the road and then was hit by a vehicle. The driver of that vehicle took off. The man who was hit was taken to a hospital and is expected to be okay. The grandmother of a five-year-old says she's praying for justice for her grandchild after police say his mother's boyfriend hit the child, killing him. According to an arrest affidavit, Daniel Garcia struck Dominic Aguilar Acevedo to death. Dominic's mother, Nicole Aguilar, told the FBI that Garcia had been abusing Dominic for weeks. The affidavit also states that both Garcia and Dominic's mother, Nicole Aguilar, fled to Colorado where they buried Dominic's body. The two then went to Costa Rica with Dominic's three-year-old sister. After the couple's arrest, the three-year-old girl was placed in foster care in Costa Rica. Now her grandmother is trying to find a way to get her back to the United States, along with raising awareness about child abuse. At least make a call. Do something. Don't let this go on. So many grandchildren could be saved, and I don't want anybody to go through what I'm going through. <laughs> biological grandparent or not. When you love a child, you love a child. Garcia is in the Bear County Jail on a $500,000 bond for injury to a child resulting in death. Aguilar is awaiting extradition back to Bear County to be formally charged. Now to the coronavirus pandemic, millions of American students returning to classrooms, some for the first time in a year and a half. But there is a lot of anxiety over the Delta variant, especially with children under 12 still not able to get a vaccine. ABC's Alex Brashe has the latest from Washington. Good morning. Millions of students are back in the classroom and many of them are too young to be eligible for a vaccine. Experts worry that COVID cases in children could soar even higher. With in-person classes now in session for millions of students across the country, concerns over a fall Delta COVID surge are growing. More than 243,000 children tested positive for COVID-19 last week, the second highest case week ever. One million children across the country have tested positive for COVID in the last month. Doctors saying those numbers will likely continue to rise. Yes, we are going to see a slight uptick just because more exposure and also this Delta variant is a little bit more stickier than the Alpha variant we saw last year. The country now averaging 1,200 deaths a day, six times the death toll two months ago. Just days after President Biden announced his sweeping strategy to mandate vaccinations, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis saying he'll find Florida cities that have issued vaccine mandates, up to $5,000 per infraction. We're going to protect Florida jobs. We are not going to let people be fired because of a vaccine mandate. Meanwhile, in Iowa, Des Moines Public Schools will reinstate a mask mandate after a federal judge's ruling. That mandate will take effect tomorrow. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. And happening right now in D.C., Senate Democrats are back on the Hill and back to battling it out over the $3.5 trillion budget bill. Democratic leaders say they want the deal hammered out by tomorrow, but House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has promised to bring it to the floor by the 27th. The problem is the centerpiece of the president's agenda is stalling within his own party. One of the major issues, of course, is the price tag. And there's still no consensus over health care provisions or climate provisions. The way you, that a compromise will most likely take place will be on how long these programs will be in place, uh, how large the programs will be, uh, but the different components are pretty well um, supported at this point. Well, many Democrats say a deal is unlikely by tomorrow.
SpaceX successfully launched a Falcon 9 rocket from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California Monday night. The rocket delivering 51 Starlink satellites to orbit. Starlink is SpaceX's high-speed broadband satellite internet service aimed at serving rural and very remote areas with little to no internet connectivity. Uh, SpaceX has now conducted 128 launches of Falcon 9 rockets. And time now is 6.09. It's about 69 degrees out there. Ahead on GMSA, why Apple's rolling out an emergency software update for your iPhone. We'll tell you what you need to know. And just ahead, part two of this week's Tejano Moments segment. We're going to tell you how a historical Texas figure earned the nickname Angel of the Alamo. Outside right now, it's really nice out there, folks. Lower humidity, lower dew points. Mike says we're enjoying temperatures in the upper 60s here in town. The very latest on the remnants of Nicholas hammering away at places like Houston, Beaumont, and Port Arthur. We'll be right back. 613, good morning and welcome back. Yesterday, right here on GMSA, we introduced you to a woman devoted to preserving San Antonio's history. In today's edition of Tejano Moments, GMSA producer Rosalind Jimenez explains how that woman earned the nickname Angel of the Alamo. In her mind, it wasn't just exclusively where a battle had been fought, but more about all of the missions that had been built by the Franciscans and the Spanish. After realizing the missions in San Antonio were falling apart, Adina de Zavala knew she had to preserve history for the generations to come. But she couldn't do it alone. Adina uh, then meets this wonderful, beautiful young woman by the name of, name of Clara Driscoll from Corpus. Uh, she's a philanthropist, uh, an heiress uh, to a very large uh, ranching empire. Rudy Rodriguez, a local historian and founder of TexasTejano.com, says Clara and Adina became good friends, frequently meeting at places like the Minger Hotel downtown. Clara ended up giving Adina $75,000 to purchase the convento, the Alamos Long Barracks. But the state assumed the purchase and refunded Clara. Then there were some disagreements about the property. Clara believed the convento was an eyesore and a park should be put there in memory of the fallen defenders. Adina, on the other hand, felt that it was a historical building. The Alamo Mission Chapter won a lawsuit to remove the building. So, in February of 1908... She enters the building and padlocks. Uh, she has the locks changed. And so the world begins to discover, and I mean literally, because uh, the media, because the media frenzy uh, becomes national. Only a few days passed before Sheriff John Tobin told Adina she needed to get out of the convento. As she exited the building, Adina said, I did not surrender. I merely left matters in dispute to arbitration. And her fight continued. Eventually, her battle won. Sadly, Adina did not live to see the victory, dying in 1955. But for her efforts, she will always be known as the Angel of the Alamo. Rosalyn Jimenez, KSA 12 News. All right, so years after Adina locked herself in the Long Barracks, claims that the convento walls were not part of the historic church were dismissed. Then in October of 1913, the second floor walls were mysteriously torn, doll, torn down. The remaining walls of the church stood in partial restoration for 55 years. We'll remind you, if you missed the first part of this week's segment, you can find it right now over at ksat.com. And for now, let's go ahead and check in with Samuel King as traffic picks up. It does. It is picking up just a little bit. The traffic time still look fairly good this morning. 28 minutes if you're coming from the Pleasanton area to downtown San Antonio. 19 minutes on 90 from Castroville. 17 minutes on 35 from Lytle. This is 90 at uh, 36th Street. and You can uh, see traffic starting to uh, build there in this area. Uh, we do have a crash not too far uh, from that area. So let's take a closer look at that. I have this reversed. Uh, this is a uh, loop 410 at South and there was actually a stalled vehicle there. It was initially reported as a crash, but we think it's a stalled vehicle. This is the crash on Highway 90, not really impacting traffic uh, too much there, but that's just something to look out for if you're heading westbound on Highway 90 out toward uh, 1604 and 36th Street. Uh, we had, uh, this is uh, some old stuff from before, the last time I was here. So let's go over to uh, Mike right now with look at the uh, forecast. Not seeing too many impacts from Nicholas in our region at all, huh? Yeah, kind of a the subtle, uh, if you will, indirect impact 
expect from with some drier air that has moved on in here and that's allowing temperatures to drop down into the upper 60s, which it's pretty nice out there. We're going to have a decent uh, wind out of the northeast today at about 10 20 miles per hour 88 for high temperature. So we'll be just a couple of notches below the normal high partly cloudy skies actually a overall nice looking day yesterday. Yeah, if some folks did get some rain from Nicholas. We had some of those uh, rain bands kind of sweep on through here, but um, well, in some cases, yeah, like this one won't be a lot, but take what we can get about a eighth of an inch out there at the airport officially. And uh, right now, a good looking start this morning. We do have a few clouds around here. Everything is dry. Nothing's being picked up on radar. Temperatures low 60s parts of the hill country. 72 Stinson 70 up 71. Pardon me up the road at Canyon Lake and these numbers dew points. The measure of moisture in the atmosphere are down roughly so anywhere from about five to almost 10 degrees compared to this time yesterday. Very dry air up there in the uh, hill country and 63 is not bad. You get below 60 and that's when it's really pleasant like what a couple of weeks ago we had those points down in the in the 50s actually uh, last Friday and Saturday then obviously the humidity came back up but it is somewhat lower this morning it's tropical storm Nicholas still 70 mile per hour winds it did briefly get up to 75 so on the books it's going to go down as a was a hurricane and it's continuing to work its way uh, on shore and it's going to or is going to work its way up to the north and continue to dump a whole lot of rain around Louisiana. Some of the radar estimates anywhere again from say five, nine, close to a foot of rain down around Corpus Christi, about two and a half to three inches and more as it moved up because the, the reason why we didn't get as much rain and there's that little bit that moved through here was because the path was shifted over to the east more as compared to what it had looked like yesterday morning. So that's why it didn't make landfall until sometime about just after midnight this morning. It was roughly about 1230 this morning. Over the next couple of days, we're going to have uh, maybe one or two clouds left over today and tomorrow. Plenty of sunshine to finish out the week. It is going to be heating up into the mid 90s. Then we get into the weekend Saturday. A few more clouds hanging around here uh, Sunday, perhaps a shower or two. And then we get into Monday and again, very, very slight chance for one or two of those uh, showers around here. Rain chances aren't that great going in toward the weekend. 82 degrees today at noon, partly cloudy skies. High temperature is going to make it up to 88, two degrees below normal. Good looking day, kind of breezy wind out of the uh, south or excuse me, out of the northeast. Beg your pardon at roughly uh, 10 20 miles per hour and then we go into the next few days temperatures will go into the mid 90s so it's, it's going to be kind of a hot finish to the uh, the week 96 on friday and chance for a little bit of rain by especially later on in the weekend and uh, you said next week the polar express arrives no, i don't uh, did, 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 did. <laughs> not quite he did not say that no no, no. <laughs> there are some indications right now that we could have a, a decent front mm -hmm. by the middle of next week but again that's still a week away so yes. a lot right. can change you know a lot of times these early fronts tend to go uh mm -hmm. not not this time. We are hopeful, right. though. Yeah. Very hopeful. So no frost advisories as of yet. No. Okay. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. 620 right now, about 69 degrees. And still ahead, Apple's emergency software update for iPhones. What you need to know coming up next. Trilogy for COPD. Birds flying high, you know how I feel. Breeze drifting on by, you know how I feel. It's a new dawn. If you've been taking COPD sitting day. down, it's time to make a stand. Start a new day and with I'm Trilogy. No once daily COPD medicine has the power to treat COPD in as many ways as Trilogy. With three medicines in one inhaler, Trilogy helps people breathe easier and improves lung function. It also helps prevent future flare-ups. Trilogy won't replace a rescue inhaler for sudden breathing problems. Tell your doctor if you have a heart condition or high blood pressure before taking it. Do not take Trilogy more than prescribed. Trilogy may increase your risk of thrush, pneumonia, and osteoporosis. Call your doctor if worsened breathing, chest pain, mouth or tongue swelling, problems you're Urinating, vision changes, or eye pain occur. Take a stand and start a new day with Trilogy. Ask your doctor about Once Daily Trilogy and save at Trilogy.com. In today's Tech Bytes, Apple's urgent warning. The company is imploring people to download an emergency software update which fixes a flaw that could allow spyware to unknowingly be installed in iPhones, iPads, Apple Watches, and Mac computers. 
Apple's holding an annual event today to unveil a new line of phones. A new report says Facebook keeps a list of profiles that are immune to the company's rules, allowing posts that would otherwise be taken down. According to the Wall Street Journal, the program includes 5 million politicians, celebrities, and journalists. The company insists it previously disclosed the program and says it was developed to give certain accounts a, quote, second layer of review. And I have my iPhone set to automatic updates, and I see this security update just sitting there waiting to be installed. So I guess it'll do it later, but oh. I'm going to go ahead and do it now yeah, yeah. just to be safe. Get it over with. Yep. <laughs> Time now is 624 and about 69 degrees out there. Still ahead on GMSA, police looking for a driver who hit a man on a bike and took off. Katrina Weber will join us with the details. And a quick check of the roads with Trans Guide out there is a look at I-35 at Nogalitos. Things seem to be moving there and also at Loop 1604 and Valley Meadow. We'll be checking in with Samuel King after the break. A driver takes off after hitting a bicyclist on this south side access road. Good morning, I'm Katrina Weber. If police have their way, they will soon track down that driver. I'll tell you more about it. And this is a live look at Galveston right now. A lot of wind and some heavy rain. And of course, we're gonna be checking in with Mike as he tracks Nicholas. We are on the dry side of the storm and Mike says that's helped pump in some drier air. It's very comfortable out there as we start out your Tuesday morning. Good morning to you. It is September 14th. Thanks for joining us this morning. Happy Tuesday. Hope you had a great day yesterday. And this morning, if you get a chance, step outside. It's really nice. Here's Mike. Yeah, it's, it's very pleasant out there this morning with some of that drier air, as you mentioned, that uh, moved on in here. We do have a few clouds still hanging around this morning, and temperature stands at 68 degrees, so the normal average low is 70. We're just below that. That number, the dew point, measure of moisture in the atmosphere, has dropped down a good... Oh gosh, anywhere across the area, five to 10 degrees compared to what it was at this time yesterday. So again, that much drier air moved in. And on the back side of the storm, we also have those winds out of the north to northwest right now. So here's the very latest. Uh, the storm did make landfall uh, just after midnight this morning, and the path was slightly further to the east than what it had looked like yesterday. And that's why, yes, we did see some rain uh, scattered about the area here in town yesterday. And then things started to clear on out because it kind of took all that and shifted it off to the east ever so slightly. And as you can see, most of the rain is on the eastern side or the right-hand side of that storm. So Louisiana is going to continue to get a whole bunch of it. But uh, there was plenty over there along the, the Texas coast over by Houston, anywhere from, say, about uh, six inches to almost a foot. Here in town, mold is moderate. Same thing with Fall Elm. Ragweed is on the low side. And uh, mostly cloudy this morning. Like we said, pleasant. Stephanie said, step outside, enjoy it. Partly cloudy today, upper 80s. Breezy wind out of the north to northeast at about 10, 20 miles per hour. Still kind of wrapping around the backside of that uh, tropical storm, Nicholas. Rest of the week, mostly sunny, but temperatures are going to start to go up. We're going to be looking toward the mid 90s by the end of the week, so we'll be a good five, six, seven degrees above normal. And then the weekend, a couple of more clouds, maybe a few uh, thunderstorms, especially late in the weekend and heading in toward the first part of next week. More on that in just a couple of minutes. Right now, with the very latest on Nicholas, Sarah, what's going on? Thanks, Mike. Well, Nicholas made landfall along the Texas coast early this morning, bringing with it the threat of up to 20 inches of rainfall to parts of the Gulf Coast, including the same area hit by Hurricane Harvey in 2017 and storm-battered Louisiana. Nicholas touched down on the eastern part of the Matagorda Peninsula, about 10 miles west-southwest of Sargent Beach, with maximum winds of 75 miles per hour. That's according to the National Hurricane Center in Miami. The storm is moving north-northeast in the center of Nicholas was expected to move slowly over southeastern Texas today and over southwestern Louisiana tomorrow. Now forecasters warning of significant flooding in the area where Hurricane Ida slammed ashore just two weeks ago. It could drop heavy rain and cause flash flooding will only worsen scenes like you see behind me. But the Cajun Navy says they will be there through the rain that's coming and they will be there into the next disaster. I know that bracing for another storm while we're still responding to and trying to recover from Hurricane Ida is not the position that we wanted to be in. Uh, but it is a situation that we are prepared for. The National Guard already in position with high water rescue vehicles, 23 boats and 15 aircraft. New Orleans is now under a flash flood watch through Thursday. We are all.
We are following this story closely with team coverage. Our sister station KPRC in Houston is keeping a close eye on the latest developments. Here is Roseanne Aragon. The latest. We have been monitoring conditions here in Galveston all night. We are joining you from the seawall where you can see conditions have improved since the intense conditions we experienced earlier this morning when we dealt with consistent, relentless winds. This is the seawall right here. It now seems the wind has slowed down and the rain has lightened, making for more manageable conditions. What a contrast. I want to take you back to early Tuesday morning around 2 a.m. in Houston. This is video from our storm tracker on the same road just headed east. You can see the intense wind and rain, very poor visibility and barely manageable conditions. The Galveston County OEM has been asking people to stay at home and off the roads. One thing they were watching very carefully, rain bands. So as the uh, eye of the storm is rotating, it's producing rain bands that are coming around uh, you know, in an arc. And, you know, those, you know, are producing sometimes significant rainfall um, and depending on the speed that they're traveling will produce um, less or more rain. So if you, you know, you have a rain band that sets up, it could produce some uh, significant rainfall if it doesn't move out of the way quick enough and kind of let some of that water to drain off a bit before that next band comes in. And the county dealt with higher storm surge than expected three to five feet. These are the road conditions now here in Galveston, wet and rainy. I'm Rosanne Aragon, back to you. We'll keep it right here as we continue to monitor this developing story and look for the latest next on Good Morning America beginning at 7. Now let's get a look at the roads with Samuel Keene. Good morning, Samuel. Good morning, Sarah. Things looking a lot calmer here than they do in the Houston area. This is Loop 1604 at Babcock and see traffic starting to uh, build uh, in this area this morning. Your fairly uh, normal traffic uh, build up there. Looking throughout the area, things are looking mostly OK. As I mentioned, we still have this report of a stalled vehicle here on the southeast side. Also a stalled vehicle there on I-10 near Vance Jackson. Looking at the overall traffic times uh, in the area, still looking fairly good. 26 minutes coming in from New Braunfels on 35. Uh, 25 minutes coming in from the Bernie area on I-10. 20 minutes coming in on Highway 90 from Castroville. And coming up later today, Bear County Commissioners are set to vote on the county's budget for the next fiscal year. That budget contains millions for road projects in the county, actually 187 million in fact. Many of those projects were already planned or are close to others already in construction, including this project there on Tally Road. Their crews are making improvements to increase traffic capacity and mobility, as well as flood control. Close to $50 million in funding for road projects would be allocated to Precinct 1 alone. That's home to some of the fastest growing parts of Bear County. Now, the commissioners have been going over last minute changes to the budget. There will be a public hearing later this morning before commissioners will vote to adopt that budget. So we'll keep an eye on that throughout the day. But for now, let's send it back over to Mark and Stephanie. There is other news this morning. A bicyclist, bicyclist rather, has been left hurting after his run-in with a car on the South, uh, South Side Highway Access Road. San Antonio police say the driver who hit him kept going. It happened early this morning along I-35 near West Pyron. Katrina Weber is there with a live report. And Katrina, is there any update on the man who was hit by the car? Well, police told us that he did not suffer any life-threatening injuries, that he should recover. Still, they want to track down the driver who put him in the hospital. The police say that the man was riding his bike on the sidewalk while carrying a duffel bag and television. They say the weight of it all caused him to lose his balance and fall onto the I-35 access road where he was hit by a car. The driver never stopped and the injured man was taken to a hospital by ambulance. Police say that man's girlfriend was on another bicycle following behind him but she told police she did not get a look at the car, so she was not able to offer any description of the driver or the vehicle involved. Reporting live on the South Side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. NEISD here in San Antonio is the latest victim of a cyber attack. District officials say it happened back at the end of August. According to Northeast Independent School District, a payroll employee was handles wire transfers was hacked. Hackers tried to change the bank where money was being wired. District system notified them of the hack before any money could be transferred. However, that payroll has access to other employees' personal info, so the district is not really sure what other information that hackers accessed. 
About 5,000 employees, both current and former, were informed of the hack. And investigators say it's not clear right now if a TikTok trend is to blame for some serious vandalism at some Northeast ISD schools. And here's a look at some of that damage. TikTok's devious lick trend encourages students to steal random items from schools. Several students have been identified as the culprits and any ISD officials expect to pinpoint more. Those students will now have to pay for the damages. Northside ISD also reported vandalism in at least six of its high schools. President Joe Biden preparing to pitch his massive domestic spending package with a visit to a renewable energy lab in Colorado. Biden highlighting how the investments in clean energy in his massive spending package will help combat climate change. Today's trip in Denver will cap off the president's two day swing to the West Coast. Across the country, the latest coronavirus numbers show that more than 1 million children have tested positive in the past month. The U.S. is now averaging six times as many daily COVID deaths than just two months ago. Health experts say President Biden's vaccine mandate for workers and health care professionals will help stop that spread. And the local organizations were hit hard by the pandemic, including those supporting the arts. That's why this weekend, five local arts organizations, including the Youth Orchestra of San Antonio, are coming together for a celebration. Priscilla Karaman spoke with the two teen musicians about why supporting the arts is so important. <laughs> Yosa is amazing. And the music we play is so much fun. One of a kind and always a good time. Those are just two things Sarah Garcia Villar and Matthew Averett tell us they love about the Youth Orchestra of San Antonio, better known as Yosa. Sarah, a junior at Reagan High School, started playing the violin in the third grade. It's so much easier to carry around than a cello. I also like the high notes of the violin. Matthew, a senior at St. Mary's Hall, learned the cello in 2015. Everyone in my family plays a musical instrument. My sister plays the violin. My mom also plays the violin. I started on cello just kind of to be like them. Both musicians say Yosa opens the door to more than a passion for music. It gives us all the opportunity to work with like-minded individuals to come together to really make something bigger than just one person bigger than ourselves. I love the friends that I make in Yosa just because we're all from like different parts of San Antonio. We all come from different backgrounds. We all have different stories. The Youth Orchestra of San Antonio consists of about 450 kids from all across the city. But for the celebration gala in September, a group of 75 will be putting on a special performance. The pandemic was a very tough time for all of us. As musicians, uh, we didn't have access to the stage. And a recent surge in COVID cases, bringing on more challenges. The celebration gala, originally planned for a live audience, is now virtual. It's challenges like these that serve as a reminder of why the arts need your support. And I know how you feel, I feel it too. My dreams that come out all the blue. You see what different people love to do, and you see, like, how, how, they, how they shape their life around what they do and who they become. It's like very special when knowing that like there's people supporting you. Priscilla Karaman, KSAT 12 News. 640, about 69 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA, the mental toll the coronavirus is taking on young people. We will get to that story in a few minutes, but first a reminder, the big game in our big game coverage this week features Wagner at Smithson Valley. Kickoff between the Thunderbirds and Rangers set for 7 p.m. Friday night at Ranger Stadium. We've got a preview over on KSAT.com. In college ball, the Southeastern Conference is fined the University of Arkansas $100,000 after Razorback fans rushed the field following their victory over the Longhorns. It was the Razorbacks' first win over Texas in Fayetteville since 1981, and it brought down the goalposts. Time check 644. Welcome back to GMSA. September is National Suicide Prevention Month, a topic that's always important to talk about, especially now that we are 18 months into a global pandemic. GMSA producer Rosalind Jimenez takes a look at the toll COVID has had on mental health in young people. Already their bodies are battling nerves, hormones, and where they fit in in their communities. Add a global pandemic and everything gets magnified, creating a huge impact on their mental health. 
According to a study published by JAMA Pediatrics, twice as many kids and teens experienced symptoms of anxiety and depression during the COVID-19 pandemic than those that had pre-pandemic. Globally, one in four were depressed, while one in five were dealing with elevated levels of anxiety. And it's no wonder, schools closed and remote learning became the new norm. Opportunities to meet up with peers and supportive adults outside of home dwindled. Extracurricular activities and hobbies all but stopped. Not to mention the constantly changing conditions and disruption to routine. According to child clinical psychologist Jenna Glover, that chronic stress can lead to feeling hopeless, and that can lead to thoughts of suicide. But there is a way to turn things around and help your kids and teens cope in a healthier way. Talk to your kids, keep a regular routine, monitor their sleeping, eating habits, and their mood. And finally, remember to seek help from a mental health professional if necessary. Rosalind Jimenez, KSAT 12 News. It's now 646. And traffic is picking up on I-35. Let's go ahead and check in with Samuel King. Yeah, uh, Mark and Stephanie, 27 minutes if you're heading in from New Braunfels to downtown San Antonio right now. A little up than it was earlier, 27 minutes also on 281 from Valverde and 24 minutes on I-10. Stephanie mentioning this traffic we're seeing here, 35 in Randolph. No real crash uh, in this area. This is just volume, the normal uh, morning commute there. So uh, watch out for that. So just looking between 410 and New Braunfels, 20 minutes each direction. That is looking uh, fairly good there, but just keep that in mind. If you're starting to head out. Also, let's take a look here at I-10 uh, from Bernie to downtown. A couple of incidents uh, being reported, but not really impacting things too much there. You see that crash icon at Bernie stage, but still 24, 25 minutes uh, to downtown from Bernie in each direction, 12 minutes in each direction inside 1604 had an earlier stall there. So things looking fairly good. How about your forecast for the day? Let's check in with Mike. Thank you very much, sir. Beautiful picture, and this was sent in by Rafael Krupa, and it is over there Kinder Ranch next to uh, Piper High School. Thank you very much for that one. Can you see this the second rainbow? Right about there is the uh, the double rainbow in that picture. Great shot. Thank you very much for the, oh, thank you, welcome, Mr. Austin. Uh, and you can warm my coffee for me too while you're at it. <laughs> okay. So uh, things are starting to uh, lighten up a little bit. We're looking over to the uh, the west right now and uh, should be a, a decent sun. We've got a couple of uh, couple of clouds out there this morning. Temperature stands at 68 degrees, 72 at Stinson, 70 in New Braunfels, low 60s in the hill country in these numbers. Uh, we're still you know, in most places above 60. That's kind of that threshold where you below 60 like back on Friday, Saturday. It's really, really nice out there, but uh, this is pretty good. Actually, these numbers are down a good five to 10 degrees compared to this time yesterday, and that's because we're on, sort of on the backside of that uh, the hurricane or what is now the tropical storm. It did become a hurricane at one point, and that's what's keeping us in this northeasterly uh, airflow loft in the atmosphere. Now, other than that, notice we've got these uh, couple of systems up there to the north and they're moving just rock straight east just about and that's kind of a zonal pattern in the atmosphere and so with us that keeps temperatures at or toward the end of the week a little bit above normal and really no great rain chances at all throughout the rest of the week and that's uh, kind of kind of confirmed by this computer model with uh, nothing going on through Friday, Saturday, a couple of a uh, couple of extra clouds around here, maybe a few showers scattered around Sunday, and then going into Monday and as well as on Tuesday, and that's pretty much going to be about it. Now, there are some indications, long range computer models, maybe a decent front by next week, but again, that's still a week away, a lot can change between now and then. 82 degrees, partly cloudy skies at noon. 88 for high temperature today. Again, partly cloudy skies, northeasterly wind, 10 to 20 miles per hour. We go back up into the uh, 90s and up in the mid 90s by the end of the week with a couple of showers by, uh, we'll, look, we'll call it Sunday, Monday, maybe a stray one there on Saturday. Not great rain chances as of right now. So, oh. Thank you very much. There's your coffee. Yep. Ready to go. We oh, are nice. we are a five star morning diner, sir. Now uh, run and get breakfast for us. Huh? Oh run my goodness, Mike! Okay. Now <laughs> you're pushing it. Demanding this morning, <laughs> but he's got nice weather today, so maybe we'll do. Ash Browns, yes or no? Oh, of course. Of course. About 6:49, 69 degrees. This may be the city's largest gallery of outdoor art, murals by the multitude. 
I'm Katrina Weber. I'll have that story tomorrow on GMSA. And taking a look outside with live cam this morning, a very nice 69 degrees right now, very nice and cool. It almost feels like fall, but uh, things are going to warm up later on this week. We'll be right back. Coming up here on GMA, I'm live in Galveston. We watched as Nicholas, a Cat 1 hurricane, made landfall in Matagorda Bay just after midnight. But the angry surf here is still moving. There are no power. More than 340,000 customers, at least in Texas, without power. But it's really going to be about the flash flooding. We've seen more than nine inches already. And now the heavy rains and very slow movement moves into Louisiana. And yes, close to or over some of the spots so hard hit by Ida, it will certainly be insult to injury. There are double states of emergency to declared right now. We'll bring that all to you and so much more coming up right here on GMA. Senate Democrats are back on the Hill and back to battling it out over the $3.5 trillion budget bill. Democratic leaders say they want the deal hammered out by Wednesday and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has promised to bring it to the floor by the 27th. Bipartisan backing is unlikely, but under budget reconciliation, the bill can pass with just 50 Democratic votes. Problem is, the centerpiece of the president's agenda is stalling within his own party. One of the major issues, the price tag. I'm looking for a competitive tax break. OK, I want to make the adjustments and changes. One, one and a half. We don't know where it's going to be. Others say that's not nearly enough. When we increase job training programs, when we increase child care, people will get back to work. We've got to lower the cost of prescription drugs for people. We've got to expand Medicare to include dental hearing aids, and eyeglasses. We have to maintain the $300 direct payment we're giving to working parents. But there still isn't a consensus over those health care provisions or climate provisions, not to mention the debate over the tax hikes on the wealthy and corporations to pay for it all. The way you, that a compromise will most likely take place will be on how long these programs will be in place, uh, how large the programs will be. Uh, but the different components are pretty well um, supported at this point. I'm Britt Conway reporting. Watching a few trouble spots uh, develop uh, this morning, things looking OK, but stuff's going to start to build here in the next half hour. So if you're heading out, watch out for areas like 151 on the west side, 11 minutes between 1604 and Highway 90. Our travel times coming into San Antonio from around the region still looking fairly good right now. Here is 1604 at Babcock traffic building there, Mike. A couple of clouds uh, off well off to the east. Those are kind of the uh, western edge of what is tropical storm Nicholas. 70 degrees right now, so we've gone up a couple of notches and still fairly dry air out there. We're gonna make it up to 88 later on today. Everyone have a great day. All right, and we'll see you back here at nine. Good morning, America is next.